please welcome Sid Rollins. Thank you, everybody. So how's the coffee? Very good. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'm from Portland, Oregon. We're all coffee snobs. So, uh, so you know, when it rains, there's not a whole lot you can do to stay inside and drink coffee. So, um, but so I'm going to be very controversial today. I'm going to disagree with most of the things that have been said at this conference. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, really focus on uh, what has become, in, in, in my opinion, instead of the mobile ecosystem, it's a mobile ecosystem because everybody wants a piece of the action and nobody wants to do anything that is core to their business, it seems. Uh, ego is a good thing, right? That's what makes us all survive. Uh, but sometimes it can get in the way. Uh, so what I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about is uh, a convergence opportunity that exists for all of us. Um, that is to think about cybersecurity and mobile payments in, in, in one breath. And, and, and it's, I think it's important, um, uh, based on what Jen and Edward were speaking earlier, uh, it's important to find what mobile payments is. So what I'm going to be talking about here uh, is um, not on the acquiring side, but on the issuing side. Um, the 30 billion identities that are issued in the payments world, um, what and how does that business get done? And that's really where we believe the convergence of cybersecurity and mobile payments uh, can help remove roadblocks in, in, in the ecosystem. Uh, but before I uh, jump into the uh, slide deck, uh, I want to get a quick show of hands and I'll scan through the room. Uh, how many of you are from what you would call yourself from the mobile industry? How many of you, your core business is the payment industry? You can raise your hand twice if that's. Um, okay. And how many of you identify yourself as mobile plus payments? Okay. So there are more mobile than payments and um, less mobile payments. Um, I'll ask one more show of hands. So consider this as a stretching exercise. Um, and keep your hands up because I'm going to ask the second question. Uh, how many of you believe Apple is going to own mobile payments? Okay, just two. Okay, uh, I was expecting more. Uh, how many of you believe Apple will take the liability in mobile payments? Okay, well, that's actually good because you made my life easier to sort of justify the rest of my slides. Um, so that little <coughs> graph that's coming out of of the land of ice is how I see mobile payments. It's, it's trying its best to survive. Um, it, it's not the survival itself that uh, made the issue. Uh, what we see mobile payments as, as the issuing side of the industry is, in the, is currently in the field of giants. Um, there are lots of different businesses uh, that, that feel like they own mobile payments, either because they are from the mobile industry uh, device makers, uh, you know, all the rumors about Apple, OS companies, you know, Google spent $100 million. It really didn't affect the bottom line, but they wasted money on mobile payments. Uh, chip makers, you know, you know ARM and, and uh, largely now Intel is thinking about how do they play a role. And we all know mobile network operators, uh, ISIS, as uh, Jen was talking about. ISIS is a very interesting story. Um, how many of you know uh, Viewtron? Any of you heard of Viewtron? Okay. Viewtron was a joint venture that AT&T formed in 1975 to do electronic commerce. Uh, they, they spent about $30 million building the company with newspaper companies because at the time electronic commerce was advertising for newspapers uh, and spent about $70 million marketing it. It went live in about 15 cities. Uh, but it didn't really go anywhere largely because of uh, control issues. Uh, so we, we, we see mobile payments very similarly. There are mobile companies that want a piece of it, and of course, payment companies that want a piece of it. Um, uh, PayPal's of the world, payment networks clearly believe they own it. Uh, merchants that want a piece of the business because you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's merchants and consumers are the two sides of the, the ecosystem that create this uh, transaction. Banks, not, not to mention them, because they fundamentally have the liability of returning your money back if you call them and complain that you can do the transaction. 
Um, and in the middle of these two are the trusted service managers, I'm sure you've heard of them, the Jamalto's, GNDs, and first datas of the world, and ISIS in some ways sees themselves as the TSM because they're not a moment for operator. Well, the reason why everybody is going after the space, in some cases, in my opinion, uh, is really not their business. Um, can banks own mobile networks? Sure they can. But should they? That's a different question. Um, can Google become a bank? Yes, they can. Should they? It's a different question. The reason why all of them are going after it is because of this large number. There are 30 billion identities issued every year uh, and managed. So when something like this gets issued every year, it's on an average five to ten dollars an identity today in plastic. This is just plastic identities, by the way. I'm not talking about non-plastic. So if there are 30 billion identities issued every year and somebody is making between five and ten dollars, you can see how big of a business that is. And, and instead of somebody spending 300 billion dollars in a year, forget about non-plastic identities, if somebody were able to say, pay me 50 cents a user a month, um, you can start to see how big of a business this could be, even without considering other identities. And we've all been made to believe that the one who enrolls controls. So everybody is in this race to enroll consumers. Uh, we fundamentally believe nothing could be further from the truth. Just because you enroll a consumer, especially in payments, doesn't mean you control the relationship. Uh, in our opinion, the one who manages liability fundamentally controls. Uh, because this is not Uber giving you a cab ride and gets into an accident and you figure out who pays for insurance. This is really your money, right? Um, <coughs> once it leaves your bank account, you're going to be really pissed off to get it back. Um, and I'll tell you a personal story. And, and, and nothing, nothing wrong with the capability of this company, and I won't mention the name of the company, but I'm sure you can guess it. Um, but two years ago, uh, my eight-year-old daughter um, was playing a game uh, in my phone. Um, it was a build-your-own zoo game, right? So it's empty piece of land, and you can strategize to build a zoo. Uh, but it was a free app for a minor. It had an in-app purchase, um, and there's all story that we kind of the dots uh, after it happened. It turned out that in-app purchase, she just said okay for something, and bought a bunch of zoo characters, which charged my Citibank credit card $99. It was not 99 cents. So it was an in-app purchase sold to a minor for $99. Um, of course, there was no way to call the operating system app store. Uh, most of them don't have a number that you can call. And often, even if you can reach them, you know, you're out of luck. Uh, so what did I do? I called the bank and said, hey, I don't know what this is. Uh, they said, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. It was a 3,000th call that we got last week. So uh, not that um, you know, the OS guys can't do the job. They're not mandated, right? They're not. They're not really looking out for your money, they're looking out for their business model, which is not to monetize fraud. Their business model is to monetize data. Banks are very different. So we fundamentally believe ultimately not that these companies can't manage their liability, they're just not mandated to their businesses to manage fraud. So whoever manages liability ultimately gets to control. And, and another case in point, uh, I'm sure all of you have credit cards in your, in your back pocket or your purse. Uh, how many of those credit cards, let's say you own five credit cards, how many of those do you own? I mean, how many of the credit card numbers are actually yours? None of them, right? Uh, it's property of the bank. They, they spend a lot of money to, to buy a bill, which is a set of numbers. So uh, it's very, very difficult to imagine a world. Uh, I'm, I'm biased, as you can probably see. It's very difficult to imagine a world where somebody that own life doesn't own liability gets to do anything, let alone all the things. So while we're in the middle of this reality uh, check-in from our viewpoint, I also want to talk about mobile actually makes this liability problem dramatically worse. Uh, if we think there are problems today, mobile makes it significantly worse because what mobile does for the first time is all of this private data that, that we used to have it in our own little cloud, let's say a private cloud. If you're going to make those private asset, assets accessible from a mobile device, you just expose all of those private assets in a public network. 
So a couple of smart guys sitting in Nigeria can access your data, probably even better in some cases than, than your own customers. So this increases the risk of business as usual. With increased risk, you have increased liability. Um, now, let's spend a little bit of time talking about the news of the day, which, which is business as usual. Global just makes it worse. Um, the target breach. Um, target breach is really a small tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, we obviously heard about the breach, um, and just yesterday, uh, the real reason behind the breach came out. And we're, we're all talking about the point of sale compromise, right? Where card numbers got stolen. But how did the point of sale even get compromised? Right? It was because somebody got into a target system that was in the club to access the provisioning of malware into the point of sale systems that target themselves uses to provision updates to, to the point of sale terminals. And Jen can probably tell more about what the business looks like. But the point here is Business as usual is itself a major problem. We heard about the target breach, but an FBI analyst uh, last year uh, at a congressional deposition said 94% of the breaches go unreported. So what you heard target, just multiply that by 20x, and that's the real, real world that we live in. And, and the core reason for target breach, as I mentioned, is somebody stole an administrative password and a combination of them. And Deloitte actually says 90% of the passwords as of December of last year are relevant. Uh, and I'll sort of justify why that is a little bit later. But this is the world that we live in, and mobile makes this worse because all of the data that's stored in your cloud is accessible from any part of the world, right? Because it's, it's in a public world. So I, I want to talk a little bit more about the realities that are, that are beginning to happen. Um, this transition, plastic card with magnetic stripe data, uh, is migrating to smart card chip based solutions. US is probably the last place to go um, to th this way, but it's beginning to happen. Uh, most of our customers in the, in the financial ecosystem are the card companies that make these cards. Uh, the amount of orders that they're seeing, even in the US, has increased significantly in the last few months. So this migration is a reality. Um, I mean, anything in payments takes a lot longer than the mobile ecosystem is used to. In the mobile environment, a generation is six months. Um, in a plastic environment, embossed cards are just beginning to go away. That's 40 years old. So this transition from a mobile ecosystem perspective, it's happening extremely rapidly from a, from a, from a payment ecosystem perspective. From a mobile ecosystem perspective, it's happening at glacier speeds. Uh, but anything in payments happens in glacier speeds. Um, and, uh, but this migration is a reality. And there is very little argument that if this were the world we had lived in, target breach would have meant nothing. Right? Uh, there would have been some loss, but not um, infinite loss um, uh, in a radical sense. Now, if, if, if you look at this technology, this clearly prevents cloning. Um, cloning becomes extremely difficult. Uh, even if you clone it, it's very easy to trace, so law enforcement becomes a whole lot easier. Today, we live in a world where law enforcement of cybercrime is virtually non-existent, right? That's what the government is very concerned about, and that's why you saw uh, um, the president issue executive order last year uh, in terms of protecting critical infrastructure. Um, but if, if this is done well, uh, this will not only prevent cloning, it will actually enable securing of online or cyber transactions. And by the way, we're actually part of the ecosystem that's helping build these standards. Uh, NIST, which is the Department of Commerce standards body, um, has draft standards out that says why, especially in mobile, a hardware-based security like a plastic uh, smart card uh, type technology is absolutely necessary. So the question is, why do we need a piece of hardware? Uh, why, why do we need the hardware that's token? Um, the answer to that is, maybe in the world you live in today, it's not necessary. Um, it might change down the road. I want to sort of motivate why that is, and therefore why a convergence of protecting cyber assets will, will, will solve the payments issue. So this is the uh, castle we all live in. Uh, it's, a, it's a common castle that we've built. 
Uh, it's a public cloud where all of our data resides. It's a very comfortable place to live. It's a very convenient place to live. Uh, security is actually second. Uh, we all believe that there are, uh, you know, not only have we stored all of our data and access to system in this, uh, in, the, in, the, in the castle, we believe that there are very strong walls, and it's true. Um, a lot of technologies, encryption, um, VPN, firewalls that have these very, very strong walls that protect the data. But what we often forget is encryption is only as good as where you store your key. Well, today, it so happens that the key is right next to the data because there is no other place to store it. Um, and then you have these doors because we still need legitimate users to get in. Um, so you have these doors, and these doors are where the weaknesses as we just learned yesterday about Target, right? So these doors are not only weak, they're actually getting weaker. Uh, so let me, let me motivate why that is. We live in a world where it's all about instant access. I request access to, a, to an enterprise system, and I need a yes or no response like the next 100 milliseconds later. So the only way you get to have that answer is to type a password, static or dynamic, doesn't matter. The type of password and the system has to respond back yes or no, it has to have a copy of your password in some fashion. And that's the world we live in. So you have a world where we have centralized assets and centralized ID authentication in the software database. So if you want to think about it this way, uh, the fortress where the data is, we're defending the fortress from the inside. So the tripwire for all of your fraud is actually inside the fortress. And guess what? By the time the tripwire gets stripped, it's too late. Like we learned in Target. Uh, by the time all the analytics work, the world doesn't move really fast. We've lost one million IDs. But that's the world we live in. That's the reality. Uh, what a piece of hardware enables, a uh, plastic smart car, or if you're able to take that and use it somewhere else, is instead of a request response model that the secrets are in the cloud, it, it enables a request challenge response model. We can talk about it mathematically, this is well proven where the secrets are with the user in a piece of hardware. What that means is your first line of defense is actually outside the fortress, right? Um, and compromises really mean only one at a time, not millions and millions at a time, which is a dramatic advantage. So you have centralized assets that bring convenience, but you have distributed ID that solves a security, security problem fundamentally. So again, this is like protecting the fortress from the outside. It's much easier to protect the fortress from the outside than from the inside. I mean, you need protection from the inside as well in case, but you shouldn't just rely on as well in case. Right? You need to really rely on the first line of defense, which is outside the fortress. Um, and, and what this also enables, as it turns out, not only enables what is known as a multi-factor ID authentication, it also creates just its own encryption layer. So if you are on insecure Wi-Fi or on a foreign network, um, it doesn't matter if the network is compromised, your transaction is protected. Uh, this is well understood in the plastic EMB world or in the dominant ID world where smart cards are used, um, where compromises, anytime they get introduced, fraud more or less disappears. Uh, let me also motivate it slightly different uh, why hardware is necessary. So this graph shows over time the gray line, uh, which is sort of the complexity of this request response paradigm over the last 30, 40 years. Our passwords have gotten more complex over the past three decades, but not at the pace at which Moore's Law has been uh, growing. Right? Moore's Law, as you know, is the law that drives our customers are with the US government and banks that do high risk transactions. Really not for average consumers yet, um, but we believe that's coming. Uh, because once the high network assets are protected, cyber criminals need to find a job and they come after human beings. Um, so ultimately, this is, this is really the world we live in. There is one user, you and I. Uh, we have multiple identities. Um, the high network identities today are about 30 billion. Um, and uh, we have multiple devices. And there needs to be, uh, if not today, very soon, depending upon which transaction you manage, a secure element of hardware that needs to be available to these devices. So again, the biggest question is, where is this hardware and who gets to pay for it? Uh, if you're able to figure out who gets to pay for it, then it doesn't matter where it is. So uh, what, what I want to really ask a question here and, and create a dialogue, um, uh, 
this as a starting point is let's take a financial <coughs> ecosystem for a moment and look at how this could get paid for. So the payments world that the uh, uh, financial industry uh, sees is there has to be some kind of a hardware secure element to prevent target type uh, issues that cost between five and ten dollars. Let's assume this needs to go into a mobile device, it still costs five and ten dollars. But they have to do this in the world where transaction fee is under downward pressure, as we know. So they're not really making a lot of money in transaction fee, they really have to make money elsewhere. But irrespective, uh, there, is a, there is a budget issue because they can't replace plastic cards anytime soon either. Plastic cards have to migrate to smart cards first and somebody has to spend the money on it, that the banks have to. So there isn't enough budget for financial institutions to say, okay, we'll pay for it. Um, so that's really the problem that payments ecosystem faces. But if you say, okay, now let's see what the security industry faces, Let's say banking. Banking has a security problem because they're also migrating to the cloud and mobile payments and mobile banking is allowing access to this data. Although low risk transactions today migrate in high risk, the cost of hardware there to secure it is the same, five to ten dollars. Cost of not protecting with hardware is going up dramatically. So they have to figure out a way to spend money. Today they don't use it, um, but at some point they will have to. So if only we were able to do the hardware that's needed for payments and the hardware that's needed for security to be the same hardware. But it turns out smart cards can be used for both. The smart card is like a secure processor that can run hundreds of security applications. So if you're able to use the same hardware for cybersecurity first, because you need it, payments comes for free. Um, so ultimately, that's really the world that we play in. We're focusing on outside the US, there is a big convergence that can happen. And, and we believe the US will also see this view of the world where payments and security converge, and we call it the parity um, um, paradigm, uh, where if we're able to get the messaging to bigger banks, smaller banks is a whole lot easier because it's, there is not a siloed business. The CIO that owns security is the one that owns banking is the one that owns payments. But in larger banks, it's obviously more challenging because it's heavily siloed. Um, not just in banks. And when you talk to payment processors, you talk to payment associations, they're all very siloed. So I think that is for this ecosystem, uh, we stand to gain benefit if we're able to converge the payments requirements and the security requirements. And we're actually um, uh, putting together a small group of companies that see value in it, that can benefit from it. And if you're interested, you can send an email to uh, importparity.org. You can just send an empty email, and we'll, we'll get in touch back with you to figure out if we can help our goal in taking advantage of this convergence that's, that's coming, where cybersecurity is going to require hardware-based security. That's a given. Um, Maybe not today, but in the next two years. That's why all the standards are being built. In fact, we're working with the uh, World Wide Consortium to build smart touch support consistently across all browsers. Uh, so e-commerce becomes card present transactions. Um, you don't need to type a number in. You actually don't have to do anything. Uh, you just have, you need to plug in a device or press a button. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity in this space. The market is vast. Anyway, I'll stop here and take any questions. Yes? Um, very, very interesting comments. Thank you for sharing and distilling it to the point where we can understand these uh, I pretty much agree with everything you said, uh, except that uh, I realize uh, that the new code parts of the uh, intelligent chips would be a solution. But if we are making mobile payments, we can also use the hardware of the phone as a part of the pen they're also pretty good as well, and can be recycled. So what are your thoughts about that? Is it a mother piece of hardware just used while we can? Yeah, no, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You can use a piece of the phone uh, as a unique piece of hardware, provided you can actually guarantee the uniqueness, which means you need to access to some kind of a security chip. You can't rely on software because you have a network device that's just as worse as the cloud. Uh, so that's really where the undercurrent comes in and the ecosystem plays a role. Um, ISIS believes it needs to be in the SIM card and the carriers are going to own it. 
um, uh, Apple and Google believe they're going to own it by putting it inside the device. <coughs> Arm and Intel believe they're going to own it by putting it inside the processor. Uh, but none of them want to own the liability, <coughs> right? So that's the problem. Uh, if Apple says they're going to own the liability, and the analysis done by the IT group says their liability in day one when they say that is $100 billion. Because they basically take the liability of all of the banks. Uh, that's the problem. Technically, yeah, you can do it. But business model problems basically prevent that being a viable solution. So it really needs to be a piece of security that the identity issuer has to trust. Right? That's the problem. Okay. Well, but if financial institutions are going to pay for it, and you get it for free or something, maybe not equal. No, free is the bad price. Um, so that's why the justification here is forget about paying for payments. Pay for security and payment comes to free. Because you have to protect your banking transaction. There's no return on investment for security. Mm -hmm. I've been in security a number of years for a very big company. You know who it is. Here's the problem and here's the solution. The target is the first breach, major breach. Okay. Americans are now becoming aware of mm -hmm. the breach issue. <coughs> It will reach the banks eventually. So only when there's a huge breach is the return on investment to invest in security there. Otherwise, they're just basically <coughs> lip service, basically. Yeah, so, 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 so security is not a sexy, sexy thing to sell. They've been doing it for 10 years, so they're quite, quite familiar. Um, I have a dress up nice to sell it. Um, so security is not a easy thing to sell. And security, and security is like engineering. When, when, when it works, nobody wants to talk about it. But when it fails, and fails miserably, that's when you really have a problem. And the, the point that I want to make is the failing miserably aspect, protecting data in the software database is impossible. Because cyber criminals have faster and cheaper computers because of Moore's Law, so you need a physical piece of hardware to protect it, and they will pay for it. They don't have a choice. So your product would have um, avoided this target breach? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. so the, the smart card technology itself would have avoided the target breach in the point of sale. But the, the larger point that I want to make is, if you look at the reason why target breach happened, it was because somebody got access to target systems by compromising the password. That is actually really easy to prevent <coughs> with a hardware like this. Right, where you secure the ID with a physical piece of hardware and encrypt the transaction layer based on that hardware. It's very well understood. In fact, it is in the web browser standards going back 20 years ago, just none of us use it. Because you know, distributing hardware is so difficult. Well, you know, at some point all of us have to eat broccoli. You can only prefer it so far. So I think the time is here and we're beginning to see that happen. Yes, last question. Okay, uh, you're not the first person uh, who has said that the target, the target breach is just the tip of the iceberg. Could you share with us your worst case scenario vision for what may be coming next? So, uh, actually, I don't have, you don't have to take my word for it. If you look at uh, the cybersecurity mandate from the president, um, if 94% of the systems compromised are unreported, because the data says 75% of them don't know it half. Mm -hmm. uh, major corporations have already been compromised, which is dormant. So that's a good worst case scenario. Um, so it, it, you are already compromised. Assume you're already compromised. Right? Because all of our systems protection is on the inside. It's all about cloud, right? You know, users don't have to store it, nobody has to store it, I store it, it's in one place. It's, it's convenient, but it's terribly insecure. Because, you know, it's like saying we're going to lock, all of us are going to lock our houses and give the key to Google because they know best. It's, it's, it's false because We need to carry our identities with us because then you can, the, the information loss is one at a time. It's physical loss of goods. Law enforcement is very easy. Today, target law enforcement, guess who's going to pay for it? All of us. Thank you.